Hi, everyone. We are visiting from Seattle. Um, I'm Evgeny. I'm a genetic manager at Payments uh, at Dropbox. Hi, I'm Kirill. I'm a tech lead at Payments at Dropbox. And we are going to share our uh, evolutionary journey and how we optimize revenue at Dropbox, which is uh, like one of the primary pay payments functions. So where did we start? Um, as you know, Dropbox is a Dropbox core business is really file storage, not payments. Payments was a side function or supporting function to, to the main business to enable paid users. So essentially, we as a payments team, we started very simple. We wanted to, the main function was really get to time to market, make it fast. So we started with the, some key decisions in our journey, like we outsourced vaulting pretty much early in, the, in, the, in our journey to simplify our life. We started with a single processor to run credit card transactions. We had just single currency, US dollars. We didn't really have data insights in the beginning, and we like, just single, single strategy, just run transaction, hope they will succeed and move on. So this is where we started. Um, as product grew, product went viral, and uh, the business starts to grow. So demands of the business increased. Um, so we started to look at what can we add to the company on the payment side. Because if, if you can imagine, convenience is one of the important functions for customer experience, and uh, having different payment methods is one of the things you look into. For example, PayPal is a very popular method, so we start to, to like, edit PayPal to the, our portfolio of payment methods that uh, we enable for customers. Um, looking into Europe, direct debit is one of the preferred options for customers, so we look into how we can add it, and this is also was added as part of our uh, options for the customers. Mobile. Apple and Google are popular, very popular with customers, so we added mobile subscription management as well. Uh, another angle of the, our expansion is uh, currencies. So it, people probably can imagine that US dollars is not necessarily the main method of payment for many countries if you go outside the US. People would prefer their own currencies. Um, so we start to add currencies. We have a handful of those, and we, we added Euro, British pounds, Japanese yen. And this is pretty much our expansion project that uh, added convenience to customers and complexity to us. So first we did realize one of the key things we are in, uh, mostly in, in the recurring subscription business, and this is one of the key things to, to understand is in the subscription business is most of the transactions are running at the background, and there's no direct inter, uh, interaction with customers. We can talk to them over emails, but it's not really interactive. And any failure in the process of charging customer for the subscription business is, is really a lose-loss situation. It's a lose-lose situation when Customer loses the service and loses the customer experience. We as business lose the customer and we have to downgrade them. Um, so that's one of the key problems we want to talk about, how we can optimize, um, how we optimize revenue for the recurring subscriptions, which essentially minimize involved return for customers. So one of the key, like, or basic steps you would do when you start doing the problems, you add data insights. So we started to instrument a lot of our surfaces to collect data so we can have more insights into what's happening in the system. We hired and we started to build new function in our uh, world, which is revenue analytics, who, whose job is really to sit down with numbers and crunch them, slice and dice them, and bring insights how we can do better in general, in terms of what kind of failures we are having, how we can um, categorize it into different buckets, and what can we do about specific failure cases. And there are a couple of examples of what, like what we went and improved on as we went on. So one of the things, retries. Retries is kind of obvious strategy for, for, uh, for any failures that you have. But for retries, we did a lot of experimentation about what kind of retries we do. How long, between, how long the time between two retries should be in optimal case. How many retries we'll do so we don't get into the situation of diminishing returns when we keep paying fees for trying out transactions. Uh, another case of optimization that we end up doing is, was dual routing. Essentially, we started with a single processor, and we realized that fallback solution is uh, one of the common techniques to enable recovery from if you failed with the first processor. So we added a few more processors to our, uh, to our portfolio, so we could run transactions not just with, with the one processor. When it fails, we could fail over to the second one, and we had some lift in this case, so it, we started to recover money. Uh, another interesting example is time and, and day-based optimizations. So uh, time-based 
our theory is if you run transactions at night, especially large numbers, they will have more likeliness to fail because of the, they could be marked as fraud. So we, we are, and so we started looking to not randomly running transactions over like whatever time of the day. We, st we start to be more deliberate about we fix transaction window into the, um, into the business hours, not necessarily weekends, more on the business hours. Day-based optimizations also has their um, value as well. You can also line up your payments with um, payout for, uh, for, for people, so you, you're likely less to run into insufficient funds problem. So essentially, given all these ideas and other ideas, we start to create a backlog of revenue optimization, and we start to execute on this and start measuring success in a like in more deliberate and more um, scientific way. Cool. All right, thank you. Now, uh, let's take a closer look at what experimentation is and how all of this works in scope of payments. Now, the first thing you want to do when you start experimenting is figure out what you're actually optimizing for. So you would start with a key metric. Uh, for us, we started with a key metric of a transaction approval rate, which is effectively the rate or the number of payments that succeed uh, through your system. However, since we're a subscription business, some of this did not work quite right, and I'll explain why. So um, as we added more retries into the mix, what ended up happening is that the transaction rate went down. Now you might say, oh no, that's terrible, but in fact, more customers were signing up. And uh, the, the reason for that is because as we add retries, the number of authorizations increase, the number of failed authorizations also increase, so the transaction approval rate goes down, whereas ultimately, uh, the customers are signing up. So we ended up quickly switching to a customer approval rate where we're optimizing for the new customers that, that are signing up. And this applies both on the new, uh, new, like new, new customers, so people newly signing up for the service, and also for people we want to retain, so it also applies to renewals. Now that we have metrics defined, the next thing to do is to figure out how to improve them. Uh, Evgeny talked about different hypotheses that we've tested, and we tested these through A-B tests. So the way this process worked for us uh, is we define a test group and a control group uh, of roughly the same size. Uh, then there's a bunch of tooling that allows you to figure out for a given lift that you would expect in the metric, how long you would expect to run the specific experiment. Uh, for example, if in order to uh, spot a 1% lift, you need to run experiment for six weeks, we'll run the experiment for six weeks, and at the end, compare the two metrics, and if there's a statistically significant difference, we'll call that experiment a success or failure. If there's no difference, then we'll call it a failure. Um, so all of these optimizations are fairly product and market specific. So as you get more and more precise uh, in the optimizations, you would have to focus on the more narrower scope uh, for example, you would have a set of experiments in Europe, a uh, different set of experiments in US. You might run an experiment on only people with debit cards to try to optimize their retry strategies. Also, this is very, very product specific, so people buying consumer products won't necessarily have the same behavior as people buying business products. And even within the same subscription space, the behaviors can be totally different uh, for example, maybe charging on Friday works for one company, doesn't work for a different company. <laughs> one thing that really helps a lot is BIN metadata. So I think the Netflix folk alluded to that before. So BIN being the first six digits of the card. So that also provides you a, a multitude of metadata about what the card actually is, where what is, it was issued. Is it a debit card? Is it a prepaid card? Is it an Amex visa? Is it a Chase visa or a different type of visa? And as you slice and dice this data, you get very interesting insight into what cards behave better, where, with what payment processor, et cetera. And the other thing is uh, with the subscription business, a lot of the metrics take a long time to gather. For example, if we have a 30-day renewal period, we have to wait 30 days to get any signals at all into the system and with chargebacks even longer. Um, so for example, if we're optimizing the number of retries or optimizing the success overall, we might look at some leading indicators like the first n retries as opposed to waiting for 30 days. So as we ran more and more experiments, uh, optimized more and more markets, what we found is that overall for a single experiment, the amount of lift you can get 
diminishes over time. So we've kind of reached this diminishing return where in terms of the engineering investment required, it kind of outweighed the gain we would get from a specific experiment. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, what, in order to get ahead of this problem, what we ended up doing is uh, utilizing machine learning to kind of automate this whole process. Uh, and there's a variety of models that you can apply for very different use cases. I'll talk about a couple of them later. Uh, but some of the potential benefits include fine-tuning different parameters. For example, if you have to optimize for the number of retry strategies, why not build a model that will tell you what those are for the specific user features that are there for that specific customer instead of trying to manually fine-tune that for the given market. Uh, it also reduces the amount of cross-functional overhead. So if you have to talk to a bunch of different teams to launch experiments or make sure you're not overlapping your population and using them effectively and you know, synchronizing with your analytics team, doing deep dives, et cetera, all of that can potentially be automated. Uh, there are actually models that allow you to just get deeper insights. You can build a model that would segment your user base into top cohorts and then you can run experiments on no, those cohorts that you find valuable or that are not performing so well. So there's a, there's a variety of different applications there. And uh, let's talk about some model features that uh, would be applicable for something like payments. Um, so you can start with the payment processor. So if you're using multiple payment processors, some of them have different parameters that you can send, all of those would become model features. Time is a very interesting indicator as well. Now, uh, you can just look at UTC time, but what is more interesting is to look at the time of the day, uh, or whether it's a weekend or not, whether it's a payday. All of this also applies to different types of time zones. So you could look at the time zone where the card was issued uh, versus the time zone that the user is in versus the time zone that they said they're in, but they're not actually in. All of those uh, could be interesting features to feed into the model. Now, there's a couple of basic transaction parameters that you'd have, for example, like the amount, currency, what are they actually buying. Uh, they're, in addition, account-specific features like what kind of user they are, what segment uh, cohort are they in, uh, how long have they been a customer, are they using the product, what part of the product are they using. All of those end up feeding into the model. And uh, you can actually figure out, as part of the model building, which ones of those are important. And there will be different amounts of importance depending on what type of problem is being optimized. Now, uh, there's uh, other payment-specific uh, features that could be useful, like the bin metadata I've mentioned before. The interesting thing about bin is there's a lot of bins out there. Not all of them will have statistically significant information. Uh, so if you don't look at the bin, you can look at the issuer or the scheme or the brand to give you enough statistical data uh, to be able to optimize the specific problem. After all, machine learning is not really magic. It's uh, statistics at scale. Um, so in order to be successful also with machine learning, uh, what you'd have to do is to build a continuous pipeline of improvement. It's not enough to just build one model or two models or three models because as the market evolves or as you expand in different regions, what's gonna happen is that the data are, is gonna change, the trends are gonna change. So what you have to do is to build a pipeline where model training, model evaluation, and deployment are kind of a continuous flow. Um, and as you expand into different regions or uh, optimize different markets, you would build new models and deploy them and evaluate on the new data sets. And that's how you can stay uh, relevant in terms of the changing market trends as opposed to A-B tests that are kind of set in stone. And if you ran them from point A to point B, uh, six months later, it's not exactly clear if those wins are still gonna be applicable or not. Now, let, let's talk about a specific application of a machine learning model. Say we wanna optimize the time when we wanna do a transaction for a renewal. Uh, now, let's say the, the customer is up for renewal. We have some wiggle room as to, when we wanna, as, as to when we can charge them. We can charge them maybe a little bit before their subscription actually expires, maybe like 10 days later. So there's a lot of different time slots that you could potentially use for optimization. Now, if we start at the point where uh, 
the model, if we start with a model that can tell us the chance of success of a payment at a specific time, we can then iterate over all potential times that are applicable for this specific customer and just pick the optimal time for them uh, and pick the optimal processor. Now, we're starting out with this machine learning journey fairly recently, so we haven't made, I guess, uh, we haven't made any big groundbreaking discoveries, but you know, look forward to hearing what other people have to offer and share in this space. Cool. Thank you for listening, and if you have thank questions, come find us after the talk.